Hi, I'm Rachel. I'm 24. And today I'm going to be sharing my life story. Uh, there's a lot to cover. Um, but I was born in Columbus, Ohio. I'm the youngest of six kids. There's five girls and one boy. Um, and my parents raised us in the Christian church. And they joined the church later in life uh, when my two oldest siblings were like the only siblings there were. And once they became Christians, they took it very seriously immediately. And that devotion has only like grown over time and like just really deepened. And for most of our childhood, my dad was the only one who worked. Um, my mom was homeschooling us, which I have like just not great like my opinions on homeschooling aren't great just because my upbringing with it was just yeah. not great it like really caused a lot of uh social anxiety for me and it was like crippling social anxiety for a while thankfully that's since like gone away but in 2001 my mom and dad like bought a company and that was like my mom's baby like it still is to this day like pretty much comes before like all of us, honestly. And our childhood was just chaotic. Like we were pretty much unsupervised all the time. And like, as a kid, it was like so fun to just have free reign and like do whatever you want. But looking back on it as an adult, it's just, it was very neglectful. Like my parents were neglectful in basically like every single way. Like I was a very picky eater and my mom wasn't even making sure I was really eating anything. So I was severely like underweight for a long time. And this sounds weird, but it'll make sense later. But I like constantly had UTIs, constantly. They would get antibiotics for it and I would like finish the like series of them. And then it would just like come right back. And it truly is like, I don't even know it was so weird and i don't know why no one like no doctor or like my parents like didn't think to like look more into it because it was such an issue right um but yeah they just never did and that will come into play later on but i ever since i was little i did not feel comfortable in christianity it always caused a lot of anxiety and like shame and guilt for me but our parents are just very toxically christian i would say so we had gone to the same church for like 17 years in total and we left it when i was nine and then we were like church shopping for a little bit and that's when my social anxiety really ramped up and that's like my first the first um like instance of any sort of mental illness that's like where it began and Another way that my parents were neglectful was when it came to us being sick. So they like would not take us to doctors really. Um, there's like several instances in our childhood where like we would get fevers that were so high that we would hallucinate. And like my mom just like never thought to like take us to a doctor. It would just get really bad, but we would fight it off. And because God gave us an immune system that can deal with everything. Um, so when I was 12, it was like my first semester at a real school because she would homeschool us to a certain point and then send us to Christian school. And in December of 2012, me and my two sisters right above me, we got like this stomach bug, like just this flu thing. And my two sisters recovered like in a normal time, it was just like a few days, but it was getting worse and worse for me. And it went on for like a week like that. And on the seventh day, my mom went to wake me up and I was still sleeping. It was like 1 p.m. And she always says that I was just so pale, like it was really scary. And she would say that I looked the way that like her mom did when her mom was dying. And that really freaked her out. And she told me that we need to go to the hospital. I was terrified because I was not familiar with that at all. And also, like, that is just scary for anyone, yeah. I think. 
Um, so she gets a hold of my dad and we go to the emergency room and they took labs, like put an IV in and put me on fluids. And as soon as they started the fluids, like I felt so good, like almost immediately. And we were all really relieved because we thought that I was just dehydrated. And I remember since I was like perking up, my dad left to go to my sister's basketball game, I think, because he was like comfortable with leaving me by myself, like everything's fine. Um, and so it was just my mom and I. And a doctor comes in to tell us about the results. And there's this level called a creatinine level that measures your kidney function. And the normal range for it is 0.8 to 1.02. That's the normal range. And they come in and tell us that mine is at an 18. And all of this kind of just went over my head because I was like so young and just didn't really understand the severity of the situation. But they said like, we have reason to believe that you're in total renal failure and we need to transfer you to the children's hospital that was like in Columbus. And you were how old? 12. Okay. Yeah. And it's so funny because I like wasn't even, I was freaked out, but the only thing I could think about was how excited I was to ride in an ambulance. I was like, this really? is going to be so cool. Like that vibe of like when you're a kid and you like want to cast mm -hmm. and have people sign it. It was like that type of thing. Um, it's just so ridiculous. But they transferred me to the children's hospital in Columbus and we meet with these two nephrologists and they confirm that I am in renal failure. Both my kidneys completely failed. And the plan was to start me on hemodialysis, which is to filter all the toxins out of your blood because that's like one of the major things that the kidney does. And did um, they know what caused it? Yeah, they later found out that it was a birth defect. Okay. So like one of my kidneys was really like small, like shrunk down. And so for at a certain point, that one like com basically completely failed and one of them was just doing all the work. Okay. And just something with like when I hit puberty, it just really, really, it couldn't handle it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that was why it happened. But yeah, we're at the children's hospital and they say I need to start the hemodialysis and then eventually they'll start me on peritoneal dialysis, which does the same thing, but you do it at home. And so they said that they need to put a catheter in my neck to start dialysis immediately. And in time, they would eventually put one in my abdomen, but they would have to wait for that to heal before they could start the other one. And they transfer me to the ICU and say that they have to put me under like right in the room and they're going to put the catheter in my neck. And they said to me, we also have to put a urinary catheter in um, just in case you can't get up. And like, we also need to measure how much like urine output you're having. And I was freaked out by that because I'm 12 and like, I don't even know that part of my body and I was just really freaked out. But they reassured me that I was going to be asleep when they put it in. And just like, that point specifically where I'm in the ICU and my parents are there and they're about to put me under, it's such a like dark memory in my head because it was just kind of the start of like so many health problems in the future. That's just like, it's a really dark moment to think about. Mm -hmm. um, but they put me under and for this next part, I want to give just like a trigger warning for sexual assault. It sounds weird out of context, but it'll make sense in a second. I'm going to be describing something that's very similar to sexual assault. So I get woken up from this procedure by these two nurses, like pinning my legs apart and trying to put this catheter in. And as soon as I'm awake and I realize what's happening, I start freaking out, like screaming, crying, like so confused. And they don't like stop they just get more aggressive. And they're like, really, like, I just didn't feel like a human in that moment because I was like begging them to stop. I was like punching at them, like begging them to stop and they wouldn't. And they like never spoke to me one time through like that whole thing. And it went on for a while 
And I eventually just like completely dissociated um, because it was just so traumatizing and so violating. And that was that was like a really, really scary moment. But for like years after that, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but for years after that, I think because I dissociated, it was something that never really triggered any emotion in me. Like I could talk about it without anything coming up. Like I just, I remembered that it happened, but there was no feeling connected to it. But that changes like later on in the story. But yeah, I was in ICU for a few days and then they eventually moved me up to just a regular like nephrology floor. I don't remember how long I was there that time. It had to have been at most two weeks, but we spent Christmas there that year. Um, we like opened gifts in the hospital lobby. Just so like depressing to think about. So I was on the hemodialysis for like a month. Uh, I couldn't go to school because I was there like every other day. And then eventually when I was able to start peritoneal dialysis, that was at home and I would do it. It was every night while I slept for like 10 hours, but I was able to like go to school and all of that. And I was on a transplant list and usually like people who are on a transplant list, especially kidney, they have to wait like at least two years to get a kidney. It's just like a really, just the process of it, like just fucking sucks. Like it's horrible. And then um, if you were to get a call, it's like immediate, right? Like yeah. To, okay. Yeah. So I was on that list. And so May comes around, May of 13. And my mom and I, through like the hospital, this sounds like black market shit, but it's like legit. We were going to go into this network of people, like 14 other people. And she was going to donate a kidney to someone in the like group and I was going to receive one. It was just like this network of people. And so on May 7th, they finalize it. They're like, you're going to be getting a kidney next month. And I was so excited. I remember telling all my friends at school and they were all so happy for me. Um, the next day, my doctor calls us and said that he doesn't like this kidney for me. He doesn't like a physiological profile of like the person that's donating it. He doesn't think it's a good match. It was just a roller coaster of emotions. I was like devastated. Um, it was just really, really sad. And then the next day at three in the morning, my dad gets a call from my doctor saying that they have a kidney that like this, it was a 23 year old man who had passed away in a motorcycle accident, but he has a kidney that he thinks is perfect. So we go and I get my transplant and I've had it ever since. It's been like 12 years and yeah, it's just been doing totally fine. Good. Yeah. It's really, really cool. That's amazing. Yeah. And so the whole time I was in treatment for it on dialysis, my creatinine level only went down to a 17. Like it was basically just like keeping me alive. But after the transplant, once it was all like, hooked up when I got from the surgery, it dropped down to a 0.8. It's just so wild, like how all of that works. And it's also weird because they just leave your regular, like your old kidneys in there. So I have like three kidneys in my really? body. Yeah. Wow. I did not know that. So yeah. they're not replacing it. No. At, okay. They wow. just put it like right on like your belly. Like okay. usually they try and put it like by your pelvic bone. Okay. But yeah. And everything was pretty much smooth sailing after that. Um, all I had to do for maintenance was drink a lot of water and take immunosuppressive medications. And also I'm assuming going back to when you were a child and you would always get the UTIs, that's because yeah. it was like leading up to. Yeah, because okay. yeah, the way that my kidneys were deformed, it was also that one was smaller, but the kidneys are attached to your bladder by these things called ureters. Mm -hmm. And the ureters were like in the wrong place. So basically like urine was like back flowing into my kidneys okay. my whole childhood. Yeah. But yeah, for maintenance, it was just consistent labs, drink a lot of water and immunosuppressive medications because when you have anything transplanted in your body, your immune system thinks it's like a foreign thing. Like if it's like, they'll think it's some kind of like sickness. Right. So you have to lower your immune system so your body doesn't attack it. 
When my health problems began, my parents almost immediately sort of exploited me. They started this Facebook page called Pray for Rachel. Um, and at first, I think they did it to just keep people updated because it was such a serious situation and there were so many people in our lives that it would have been too much to like be texting them or whatever. Once the health problems began, I had pretty serious like just mental problems. Like I was 12 and I just like truly wanted to die, um, which in reality, it's just like you don't want to deal with the situation. It's not like actually wanting to die, but it was well, like that. that happened too at yeah. such a young age. I feel like and I think, too, when you're dealing with something physical and then that kind of gets better, then yeah. your body turns to the next thing, which is like right. going back to the mental. No, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And I don't know what this is with my parents, but they just didn't tolerate me being upset about it. They shut it down very quickly. They would tell me that I was too blessed and that God could have killed me, but he decided not to that I'm so lucky and people have it worse. And they they really saw me being upset as like, it was like sinful. And it was just very dark, very dark thing going on. And that was the reality of it. But on this Facebook page, every single post was so positive. It'd be like a picture of me with like a thumbs up. And they'd be like, Rachel's doing great. Spirits are so high. And like, praise God. And I think what it became was on one end, I think it helped my parents um, to like reinforce their faith almost because, and I, I kind of like just pretended to be a Christian at the time. I didn't really like feel that way, but I think it helped them seeing me be happy because of God. But then I think it low key became a thing for all the people following the page because they're all mostly Christians and Christians are so weird about kids who are sick. It's like so disturbing almost. They just like really like idolize you and it's just really weird. But that's kind of what that page turned into where it was just like not real. And mm -hmm. they would sometimes have me write posts and like say I'm doing great when like I didn't feel that way. Um, so that was just a really odd thing that it turned into. Well, I think... Something challenging, there's so many different ways to look at it, but one thing is I think that parents feel a lot of times like it's their job to like keep your spirits high and mm -hmm. not let you get down to a level of yeah. feeling negative. But yeah. no matter what age you are, we're all entitled to feel mm -hmm. however we feel, however we want to feel, yeah. however our minds are making us feel. Obviously, none of us ever want to feel negative or down, yeah. but – just because you feel that way, even though, yeah, you were lucky and blessed that, you know, you had this transplant it was, yeah. and it was successful, doesn't mean that mentally you're going to be matching up with that. Right. Because you are still so young. Yeah. And those are all very traumatic things to happen. Mm -hmm. And a small young brain cannot grasp all of those things yeah. and keep it pushing. Like you're yeah. not an adult. You're For not sure. like, you know what I mean? There's so much there. And I think a lot of times people especially our parents can't really understand that and mm -hmm. understand like wow like my kid really went through something yeah. and I should make sure they're okay mentally I think yeah. obviously they probably saw oh she could have died and she didn't we're so happy she's mm -hmm. here which yeah that's great but like right. now let's work on the mental health right um a lot of people don't realize that and another thing is with the religious aspect I think that on one end it's great to if people want to pray and believe in prayer and believe in God and miracles. Good. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. Do your thing. Yeah. But I think that pushing it very hard on people, yeah. whether even if you, even if you raise a kid to be religious and you're mm -hmm. a religious parent, mm -hmm. I'm trying to think out of where this, cause I know my mom's going to be listening. And like, <laughs> I told my mom not to listen to this no, like, because of this. Right. Reason. No, I, seriously though. But like yeah. there's religious parents and they might raise their kids religious mm -hmm. and you might have this religious upbringing. And the parents, I think, they expect their kids to be that way and turn out that way. But I never think anybody should push religion or anything, spirituality, yeah. anything on anybody. Yeah. So to have this whole success story around your health to yeah. be so 
focused around that and turn into this whole prayer thing and Mm -hmm. all this positivity, I think it can really put like a bad taste in your mouth towards that. Yeah. Which I, once again, I don't think outside perspective or parents realize why. I think Mm -hmm. that they look at it like you're selfish and bitter and mean. But I think that if you're not going through it, you're not going to really understand why you're feeling the ways that you're feeling. Exactly. If that makes sense. No, for sure. And I think it's like, I think when something really hard or like devastating happens to someone and then like other people are involved I think they're at the core of it they're so angry at the situation Mm -hmm. but it comes out wrong sometimes where it was like the anger would come out on me but I think they were also just really mad that it was happening to me and like I agree I like feel if you like are religious that's great and like if that works for you, like, I love that. It's just that the majority of Christians I've come across in my life are just, like, bad people. So that's mm-hmm. why I have such, like, a negative connotation yeah. to it. Well, I think, too, even if there's religious people that aren't necessarily bad, I think it's very hard. I don't think they realize this because in their mind they're doing the right thing. Yeah. But I think it's really hard for people that aren't religious or don't believe in the same things to relate or to agree Mm -hmm. when every single thing they're talking about is just religion based like she's saved because of this or she's okay because of this like if that helps you sleep at night right great like i believe in miracles i believe in a higher power Mm -hmm. i cool but like i think that we can have a balance of yeah. like just kind of being like, I'm just so glad you're okay. However right. it happened, you know right. what I mean? I don't know. No, I know exactly I what I think you that mean. that's kind of where it starts to get foggy because not everybody believes in the same thing. Exactly. Yeah. And it's a lot. Like, it to is. put it all on like <laughs> in one, in the, you know, I just, yeah. it's a lot. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's where like my religious trauma really comes from. Yeah. Because like growing up before all this happened, most of my memories of it are very good. Mm -hmm. I think I, my religious experience is not nearly as bad as what a lot of people go through. Like I didn't go through any like abuse through my church. Like it was, I look back on that very fondly. Um, But when all of this started, I kind of saw like the darkness of it and it's just unfortunate. Um, I think sometimes too, like the fakeness. Yeah. Yeah. It's It's, like everywhere. It's so bad. And what also started during that time was kind of like addictive uh, tendencies. So addiction like runs in my family and I was just thrown into this world where like I was getting like painkillers and when I would have my consistent panic attacks, they just like would give me Ativan, which is basically like Xanax. Um, instead of like teaching me tools on like how to deal with the panic. And since I was just so scared and so much pain from the situation for so many reasons, it was just like an escape for me. And so I would I would pretend to be anxious, pretend to be in pain sometimes just so I could get it, just get some relief. Uh, and it's just sad. It's really sad to think of little me like going through that because um, it's something that affects me like to this day uh just like different substances but after I got my transplant it was smooth sailing uh for a while and then when I was 15 um and I think it was like April 1st of 2015 which like is so ironic to me but I was at school and after lunch that day I started to get kind of this pain like in between like right below my sternum And I didn't know what it was. And it just was getting worse and worse as the day went on. And there was a volleyball open gym after school. I played volleyball for eight years, I think. I told my coach that I was having this pain. And after describing my symptoms, she thought that it was heartburn. So she told me to take Tums. I did. But it just kept getting worse. And this was on a Wednesday. And I skipped school Thursday, Friday because it was just debilitating pain. We just like didn't know what was going on. Um, so we went to the hospital. They did some tests and they noticed that the whites in my eyes were yellow. And so they were thinking it was like hepatitis, but they admitted me 
And for a few days, they were just doing different ultrasounds and scans and labs. And they concluded that it was either hepatitis or it was cancer. And which is just horrible, <laughs> my two choices. Yeah. Because they saw some sort of enlargement in my abdomen, but they couldn't tell if it was a mass or some uh, inflammation. So one day I'm in my hospital room with my dad this doctor comes in and he seems like he hasn't slept in like a week he's very frantic and like seems like there's something really wrong with him and he tells us that he was like i can't tell you for sure but it looks like it's hepatitis i'm like 99 percent sure it's just hepatitis and my dad was super relieved the doctor left the room and he was like oh rachel this is this is great news and I felt weird. I was like, I don't believe him. Like, I don't want to get my hopes up because that's not the definitive answer. Something felt off about it. And a few hours later, about nine or 10 doctors walk into my room and they tell me that I have cancer. I have non-Hodgkin's Burkitt's lymphoma. And after I heard that, I just completely was in shock. And I don't remember anything else that they were saying. I remember just staring at the foot of my bed. I was wearing like these pink, like fuzzy socks. And there were just so many thoughts going through my head. And I was like, uh, just tears. Just thinking like, am I going to die? Like, how did this happen? Like, what's going on? Like, so confused. And whenever you're admitted in a hospital, the doctor, if a doctor comes in, they We'll do like a really quick assessment, They'll like listen to your lungs and do other things before they leave. And it was really sweet because all of them were coming through doing that. And they all were saying like, you're going to be OK. Like, so sorry, this is happening. You're too young for this, but like, it's going to be OK. It was just like a sweet moment. Once they left, I left the room because I just needed a minute. And it was on the 11th floor of this hospital. So I love to always sit in this like big glass window and look at the city. And I was just sitting there, so confused, so scared. My dad comes out and sits next to me, and he's just, like, weeping. Like, I had never seen my dad cry before, and it was just so heartbreaking. And he was telling me that he would do anything in the world to take my place. And then he tells me, to reassure me, um, that it's very treatable. They said it was very treatable. It's like a three-month treatment. Um, it's going to be okay. And I think kids are so resilient. That's like that's something I'm really proud of from that time is just the resiliency of like just a child because I instantly was like, okay, mm -hmm. like I'm fine then. Like I can do this. Okay, if it's curable, like whatever. Like I got through this other thing. Like I'll be fine. And I ended up being hospitalized for a whole month. And they moved me up to the oncology floor at the, the top floor. And that was such a surreal moment. They were giving me a tour of the whole floor. And because the cancer patients, like some of them basically live there. Like they're admitted for months at a time. And so they had like, it was different from the other floors. There was like a classroom, there was like a teen room, and then like a room for the smaller kids. And just walking through and peeking in all the rooms and seeing these kids of various ages just bald. It was so weird. It was seriously so weird. And so the plan was to put a port in my chest for chemo. And they started me, I don't remember what the regimen was. It was like a few different kinds of chemo, but I was gonna have four rounds in total. And what that would look like is I would be hospitalized for eight days on the first day, they would start the chemo and I'd be on it continuously for a week. And on the first and last day, they would do a spinal tap, which is where they put like a needle in your spine and they take a sample of the spinal fluid and then put chemo into the spinal fluid, well, into the spine, just because they really want to be cautious about anything with your brain. and. Even if they can test and see if there's any cancer in your central nervous system, like, I actually know if that was the right word. Um, they just want to be sure. So they would do that. And the spinal taps were just 
Oh, it was rough. Um, I'd be asleep for it, but usually they'll have people lay down for an hour afterwards. Like you have to lay flat to keep from getting a headache just because your spinal fluid, it's so fragile and like just sensitive where it can really like fuck up your um, equilibrium mm -hmm. if you take anything out of it. So, but that never worked for me. They would have me lay down for like seven hours because I would get these horrible spinal tap headaches, which is just essentially the worst migraine you've ever had in your life. And it lasts like weeks. Mm. So that was like a big, a big side effect for sure. And yeah, that's what the week would look like. And then I'd get two weeks off. And I just, I had so many different weird side effects through all of it. And typically the side effects don't hit you until like a week after your treatment, which I didn't know that until it happened to me. But yeah, it was, it was pretty rough, I would say. Uh, shaving my head was so weird, really, really difficult. It was just like a roller coaster of emotions when that happened. I was like laughing, then I was crying, then I was laughing and crying through the whole thing. But I got used to it, of course. And once again, mental health was garbage. It was just like a situational thing. Yeah. Because when all the kidney stuff was basically over, I was totally fine again. Um, but then when the cancer came, it started right back up. And yeah, that was really tough. Yeah, my mental health was just really bad again. And another thing that happened was I almost became this like token sick friend or token sick person to the people at my school. I just felt like I was like some attraction because people would come and visit me who I wasn't friends with and they would like come to take a photo with me for Instagram and then, excuse me, and then continue not to talk to me after that. Like it was just so yeah. odd. Yeah, I hated that. Like, and I didn't realize really what it was until later on um that these people just really needed that instagram post uh yeah it was just really weird mm -hmm. but yeah so that went on from april to july mid-july i was done finished all my chemo and for kids they usually won't say you're officially in remission until five years after like you finish treatment i forgot to mention this part but Basically how it happened was a healthy person with a healthy immune system, you're fighting off cancer cells every day, but your immune system can handle it. But since mine was suppressed and it was suppressed too much, that's how I got cancer. It's kind of common. It's called PTLD. It's post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder. So... Yeah, it can happen to like any person who has any sort of like autoimmune thing. Like even if you just have Crohn's and you're treated for it, it can happen too. But yeah, that's how that like all came to be. But yeah, after that, I was fine for a few years. And Started the treatment back was only three months. Yeah, and yeah. then you do they test you again? Yeah, I would have consistent labs and scans and like meeting with my nephrologist. So or after the three months, it was successful. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then you went on about life again. Yeah. Okay. They'll do a scan like in the middle of your treatment to see where it's at. And it was perfectly on track with okay. what they wanted. Um, yeah. So it was just maintenance things afterwards. But that was the summer before sophomore year. So I went through sophomore year fine, junior year fine. Um, I got in my first relationship junior year. And that's when my mental health stuff really came out. And I think it's just when you have your first relationship, it's like this new dynamic. And I think a lot of your childhood stuff can come out or you just like repeat what you saw in your parents. But it was mental health stuff that I didn't even know I really had until this relationship. And I would have really horrible social no, I'm sorry. So remember. I had really horrible separation anxiety from him. And I had a mini kind of breakdown my senior year because it's so embarrassing. 
because he went on the senior trip and my parents didn't let me go. I wasn't going to see him for like a week or two. And I would just have like a breakdown over it. And my parents set me up with a therapist and then I was on anxiety medication, but it was just out of van. It wasn't like a consistent thing that you would take because typically out of van is just for panic attacks. It's like something you don't use that often because it's so addictive. Right. It's in a group called uh, benzodiazepines and they're so addictive. It's just like not safe to use it as much as I was using it. Then I graduated in 2018 and started at nursing school the fall of that year, which my parents really wanted me to do it because I could relate to the patients and I could tell them how God got me through my problems. How he'll get you through yours. Like I just didn't want to do it at all, uh, but I did it anyways. And then during that semester, I was sexually assaulted by one of my like best guy friends. And that is a moment that really started just the decline of like my adulthood, just mental health wise. And after that, the abuse of the benzos got really bad. Um, like I was constantly just taking them and I would like black out. I would do things and not even remember what I did. Like I would fully leave my house and come back and have no memory of what I did. Um, I just didn't want to feel anything. Yeah. I didn't want to be in my body just because that was so much. It was just too much. Yeah, you didn't want to face anything yeah. that you were feeling. Yeah. And then my boyfriend and I, we broke up in fall of 2019, I think it was. And then going into 2020, I got into a relationship with a guy who was really sexually abusive and was just a very scary man. I, I know people throw this word around a lot, but I genuinely think he was a psychopath. He just was a very scary person. And that only went on for a few months, but it was just a bad situation. But in the beginning of 2020, I smoked weed for the first time and loved it. I loved how it felt. It was just an accident waiting to happen, basically. But I only did it socially after I tried it for the first time. Like that summer, I would go boating with my friends a lot. And just someone always had like a dab pen. So we were just, that's how I was doing it, mostly. Then in the fall of that year, I reconnected with this old friend, this like childhood friend, and she was a stoner. And she's the one that introduced me into like smoking actual weed. And we were always high, like constantly. Um, and it became very habitual after that. And it was something I really would crave. Mm -hmm. And our friendship only went on for like six months in total because it was kind of toxic. But... Also during that time, I cut off my whole friend group at college because they were, they're really horrible friends, like just like high school, like bully stuff. And I cut them off and it was fine because I had this new friend. So it was like, okay. But then right after the new year, beginning of 21, um, our friendship like blew up. Like it was just huge, like falling out and my mental state just really, really plummeted because I had like no one anymore. And I just started back to school. And I think like coming off from smoking all the time like, did something to my brain. So I asked my parents if I could take that whole year off of school just because I was wanting to take care of my mental health. And they allowed me to do that. So once I started college, I wasn't religious anymore. I was straight up with my parents about it, how I just, it never felt right to me and it was just not what I identified with anymore because they just put a lot of pressure yeah. on all of us growing up. And there was so much shame if, like, you didn't want to go to church one Sunday. Like, they'd be so, like, passive aggressive towards you the whole day. And it was just horrible. And it got to the point where, because I was so, they made me so anxious about it, but I hated, like, the religion. I just hated being a part of it that I was going to my own church by myself and they like had us on fine friends. And so I would like go to the church and sit in my car the whole time. So they like thought I was there and then I would go home. And that didn't last long because 
I was just, I can't do this. Like I'm 18 now. Like I don't need to be doing this. Like just, yeah, it was just, it was nice to finally be freed mm -hmm. from it and get to where I am now where I'm just like spiritual, like definitely believe that there's some sort of higher power, but not all the rules and right. like all just like the hatefulness that comes from it. But yeah, I just backtracked really quick, but I wanted to mention yeah. that part. But yeah, back to end of 2020. So in December of 2020, I started nannying, house sitting and dog sitting for this couple that my brother's wife connected me to. They, She worked in the hospital with the mom. She was a doctor. And I'm going to be referring to them as family A. Okay. Um, yeah, it was parents and then one little boy. So I, this part just gets kind of confusing. When I'm, when I start talking about the beginning of 21, it's like all of this is overlapping with dog sitting and like babysitting for this first family. But like I was saying, I decided to take the whole year off of school uh, just to like take some time and kind of find myself more just because I was so confused with just like my identity and like all of that. So it was nice to like be done with it for a little bit. And in March of that year, I went and visited my oldest sister. She lived in Boston at the time. And her name is Lauren. She's like my best friend. She's the oldest. I don't know if I said that, but literally my best friend in the whole world. Like we've always been really close. And when I visited her, she was pregnant and she just happened to go into labor while I was visiting. So her little baby, Dakota, she's, I truly like love her. Like she's my own child. Like she's just, oh my goodness. I think just since I'm so close to Lauren, it was just like this really deep bond. And just with all of the like depression I dealt with, I'm just so thankful for my siblings, like kids, because it's truly given me just like a will to live and like something to hold on to and something to just love, mm -hmm. you know? And that was a really great way to start that year. Um, and then April comes around and my sister, Liz, and our friend Lauren moved in together in an apartment that was like 10, 15 minutes from my parents' house. And Lauren is, she's probably gonna watch this. Lauren is a stoner and when they moved in together, her and I started smoking together a lot because I hadn't for like three months. So yeah, we just were smoking all the time. And it got to the point where I was like buying my own stuff now and like had my own like pieces because the friend, I never like bought anything. Like I would just always smoke through her. And so yeah, we were just literally high all the time. It was like a lot, a lot of weed. Um, and like I said, during that time, there's family A. They introduced me to a family that they were friends with, which is family B. It's a pregnant mom, the husband, and then a little boy. And then family A at some point introduced me to a third family, family C. Sorry, this is so confusing. And it was parents and then a, uh, like, almost newborn so there's but. family a b and c yes and the primary one is family a okay. they're the ones that connected me to, to okay. everyone i i like loved them they were really really good to me and they were very comfortable with me uh and i just thought they were like the coolest people ever and they're the main ones that like hooked me up with such a weird thing to say they connected me with the other families. They were very, very good to me, very generous and just kind. I just loved them so much and just thought they were the coolest people ever. And I would kind of notice things about all of these families that I was making like mental notes of. So just like little things that 
seemed a little off to me, but I didn't think anything of it until later on. Like with family A, they would make like kind of like dark jokes in front of me. And like there was this one time where the dad was helping the son like go to the bathroom because he's being potty trained. It was just the three of us. And the little boy was like, it's not working. Like I can't do it. And the dad was like, I get it. Like sometimes my penis doesn't work either. Like he like said that in front of me and I was like, right. That's weird, but just weird stuff like that. And then with family B, they were getting ready to move out of state. And the wife would always make these comments about the husband because she was pregnant and she was like primarily the person that was like packing up the house. Like he would work a lot, but he like wouldn't help her. Mm -hmm. She was like very pregnant. She would always make comments about how he's like not helping out and like how she never sees him and all of this stuff. And then there was family C who they were really sweet, but the dad worked from home. So I would be there watching the baby and he just gave me like this weird vibe. Like while the baby was napping, because he was a fairly young little baby, so he slept a lot. And during those times I would sit in the living room and I would like read a book. And he would like always come downstairs and like sit in there with me and just talk to me for like the longest time. Mm -hmm. And I just, for some reason, had such a weird feeling about it. And then I remember in their bathroom, they had a photo from their wedding and his best man looked so much like their son. And I remember thinking like, dude, like, is this like tea? Like, what is going on? Like, I mean, exactly. Like, it was so weird. So I'm making all these mental notes of this. And this is over like, I would say, because I started with Family A in December of 2020. And then the main event I'm about to bring up happened in July of 21. So this is, I was watching for all of these families Mm -hmm. because eventually Family B moved out of state. They were all packed up. And then I started nannying for Family C. And then was just like dog sitting, house sitting, date night, babysitting for the family A. So during all of this, I'm smoking very, very heavily. And I have several family members who have schizophrenia. So I have a predisposition for psychotic disorders. So what essentially had happened was at like the end of june i my mood started elevating and things were kind of just changing mentally um and i was really like thinking about all these little things i had noticed like these dots i thought i was connecting and was about to jump to a very crazy conclusion but in the beginning of july i uh, was really reflecting on like the cath the catheter thing that happened the like assault basically so beginning of july i was reflecting one night on the catheter thing that happened the assault and i couldn't sleep all night because i was really thinking about it and like it suddenly was like the trauma caught up with my body and I was freaking out over it and so upset. And it was as if it was happening to me again. Um, Just because, like I said, I dissociated. And I think it was just buried within me for so long. And then it all of a sudden just like hit me. And it was just really, really horrible. And something I didn't mention with the story is while that was happening, the catheter thing, my parents were outside the room and so were two of my sisters and they're hearing all of this. And what really was making me upset about it when it came back to haunt me basically was I was like, why didn't my parents do anything? Like, why didn't they bust into that room? Like, I can't imagine as a parent, like not doing that. And I really thought that it was the root of why I was so like mistrustful towards them because I just couldn't 
wrap my head around the fact that they didn't do anything about it. So yeah, the morning finally comes around after having thought about it all night. And I'm just like hysterical. And I go to my sister Liz and I say, can you go with me to mom and dad's? Cause I need to talk to them about this. And it's just like, I need to hear like an apology or something because I just, it's so upsetting to think about. So we went and talked to my parents and in very typical fashion, they took no responsibility at all. And I, they probably said like I was remembering it wrong or like just, they just don't apologize for things. They, if they don't remember a certain thing, they're just not going to apologize for it. Yeah. They remembered it, but it's just like that same vibe of like, I don't know. So I had that conversation with them. Didn't really go well, but like almost immediately after the conversation, I essentially was thrown into a full-blown manic episode. I felt amazing. I felt like on top of the world, like everything they say about manic episodes, that's what was happening. But I was going into psychosis. I was slowly going into psychosis. So all of those weird dots I connected about these families, I was drawing conclusions about all of it. Like just was having these like really, really crazy delusions basically. So a lot of the beliefs I was having at the time were very manic, but then there were ones that were very psychotic. So I had this weird belief that I had like power over like energy and like electricity. And I like believed that I was like about to become like famous. And then like this one, this part's so funny. I pull up to my house one day, I'm just in my car and I'm all of a sudden, I just think, cause everything I was thinking, I believed it. Like I would have one random thought about like a random thing and I'd be like, oh yeah, that's true. I sat there, I started crying of tears of joy because I thought, I thought that Harry Styles was the one. I was like, I'm meant to be with Harry. And I was like crying. I was like, oh my God, it's been him all along. <laughs> I think a lot of people probably do that and think right? that. So. <laughs> but I remember I went into my room. I got rid of all of my Harry stuff. I threw out my posters, mm -hmm. my records, my CDs. Because I was like, well, when we meet, like I don't want to seem like some crazed fan. So I like got rid of everything. Mm -hmm. It was so funny. And like just this super elevated mood, especially with the energy thing. That's also embarrassing because my sister and her boyfriend at the time and our friend were like witnessing all of this. Mm -hmm. And they're just kind of like, what the fuck is wrong with her? <laughs> like, yeah. What is going on? Yeah, I just felt great. And during that time, I wasn't really eating or sleeping because mm -hmm. I just was on cloud nine and like felt like I didn't need these things. Right. So I'm just slowly falling into like madness at the same time. I'm having all these delusions and I felt like I had, I felt like I was on a mission and basically the biggest thing with this whole episode was I thought that there was a child sex trafficking ring going on with all of these families. Like I really, really was convinced and just since my, like I said before, since my brain was just like, I was severely like unwell and I would remember certain things and then believe to my core that like, that's what these things meant. And like, I remember they had like baby cameras that are like connected to your phone. And I thought that they were like watching me through the cameras. And I just really believed that there was some like ring going on, which is just so dark. And I don't want to get too much into the details of like the things I was thinking, but all I can say is that I was having just very disturbing thoughts and like really worried about this happening. Two weeks into nannying for family C, um, I get up one morning and drive to their house for work. And as I'm driving there, I thought I saw um, the husband of family B, the ones that had moved out of state. 
saw him walking down the street and he was a doctor. Saw him walking down the street smiling and over his shoulder on like a hanger was like his like white coat. And I saw him and I was like, why is he here? Like what's going on? Like I instantly thought like, did he come back here and like abandon his wife because of like all the things she would say about him. And so I call the family A, the wife. I call her and I'm like, hey, like I just saw like Jeff and I'm really confused because like I thought they were out of state and like I'm just worried that something happened. And she on the phone was like, that is really weird. It's weird that she they wouldn't tell us they were in town. Like, let me call her and then I'll get back to you. Then I go to work that day. Um, and the dad was just giving me weird vibes. And at this time, I'm believing that there's this like ring going on. And I was convinced that like the husband was like going to leave his wife that day for some reason. I was just like felt like all these things were like, off at one point there was like a guy outside who was like uh like doing like mowing like some i don't know he was doing some yard work and i was convinced that it was my abusive ex i like thought he was outside the house and at the time i was talking to this guy and i texted him like this paragraph saying that he was like a friends with benefits and i like texted him this paragraph about how i was in love with him and that he was the one, which like make up your mind. Like, is it him or Harry? Like, I don't know, <laughs> but just humiliating. And so I was so anxious about things that I like told the husband, I was like, I need to go home. Like, I don't know what's wrong with me right now. I'm very anxious. I need to go home. He was like, okay, cool. So I drive home and I can feel something brewing, like some weird feeling in my body, like something was happening um, and it was just about to like explode. And I remember sitting in the living room with my dad and I got a notification of like the baby monitor, of like the baby moving. And I saw that and thought like, oh, they're tracking me, like they're watching me. And I remember asking my dad about like a VPN. I was like, should we like a VPN? Like I feel like our phones aren't safe. He was like, no, like, don't worry about it. You're okay. Uh, at the time, I would go on drives a lot. So I leave the house, tell my parents I'm just going on a drive. Um, I leave my house. I call the wife of Family A because she never got back to me. And I call her. And almost instantly when I heard her voice, I just have a meltdown. And I start panicking. And I'm like... I'm coming to your house, like something's going on. Like, I need you to call the cops. I need the cops to be there when I get there. And driving there thinking that like all the people in the cars are following me, like I'm driving by, like just so out of my mind. I get to her house, there's no cops. So my thought is, oh, like they're unsafe. Like they're in on it, like this is bad. I go in, she sits me down at the table and we start talking. I was convinced that all of the families were upstairs and that they were like gonna jump me. They were gonna like take me away. And I'm sitting there telling her about the conclusion I came to about the catheter situation and just really like dump a lot on her. But I never told her that I thought this ring was going on because I didn't know if I could trust her or not. And at one point, she looks at me and she's like, Rachel, um, Jeff, family B guy, like he's not in Ohio. Like they're in like whatever state they live in. Like he, he's not here. And I was like, like had this split second where I was like, I'm losing my mind. Like I'm literally crazy. But then immediately after that, I was like, she's lying. She's lying to me. Like... I can't trust her. So basically when I saw him, I completely hallucinated him, which is wild. And so, so she- So are you diagnosed with schizophrenia as well or no, that just runs in the family? No, so like, I'll get to that, okay. like the diagnosis, but it- okay. Yeah, so 
Yeah, so I like somehow I like try to leave without like looking like I'm rushing because I like really feel like she's after me. This was a part I completely forgot to mention, but all of these families, they all worked at the children's hospital that I was treated as a kid. So that really played into what I thought was going on. And I remember when I was sitting with wife A, telling her about all of this, I brought up like my doctor that I was seeing at the time. And she pulls up her phone and she's like, oh, what's his name? And she instantly like finds it. And she's like, is it him? Like it was in a matter of like five seconds. And I remember being so weirded out by that because I was like, how did you even find him that quickly? Mm -hmm. She was like, oh, like we used to work together, like whatever. And honestly, to this day, all of my delusions, all that is over. But to this day, I'm like still so confused by that moment where I'm like, right. how did you find that so fucking quickly? It was like really odd. But yeah, eventually I'm like, I'm fine. Like, I'm just going to go home and go to sleep. Like, I'm okay. And I remember she's saying bye to me. And I didn't know that this was just like a saying that people said, but it was just so unfortunate. But she goes, all right, like, go to sleep. Like, I'm a mile away. And I remember, and I was on my way to the guy's house I was talking to who lived right by them. And I was like, oh my God, like, she knows where I'm going. And I just didn't know that that was a saying of like, I think it basically means like, oh, I'm here for you or right. something. So I drive straight to the guy's house. I would just walk into his apartment. Like I didn't even tell him I was coming. I show up and I was like, we were talking, like catching up. And at one point I say, I said, I was like, I love you. And his reaction is so funny. He just goes, I need a cigarette and like gets <laughs> up. <laughs> so we go outside. He's just smoking a cigarette. And I'm just sitting there like feeling so like, stupid i'm like what did i just do and that was like the whole visit like mm -hmm. i just i from there i was like okay i gotta go went home and my parents had no idea what was going on but i couldn't sleep the whole night because i was convinced that they were after me um and i was really terrified like anytime i tried to doze off i would like immediately wake up and like freak out i was like i i need to be like i need to sleep with one eye open basically i was like they're after me my parents were trying to like help me fall asleep like all night like trying to sit with me like it just nothing was working so the following morning i it's weird because there were just so many conflicting things it was i believe this is happening and then a small part of me like knew it wasn't but the delusions were mostly taking over. And I told my dad that he needs to take me to like a mental hospital. Like he needs to take me to the hospital. Um, Cause like something's wrong. And then I also was thinking, well, I'm so scared that they're gonna kill me that I might kill myself because I was just so terrified. And like, Right before we left, I told my dad, I was like, this is insane, but I need to like smash my phone because I think they're tracking me. Like I need to smash my phone. And so I smashed my phone with a hammer. My dad just watched me do it. And that's just a really sad memory because my dad's brother uh, has schizophrenia and he saw him through a lot of his like episodes and that moment was just really hard because I was like, he has to deal with this with like his kid. He takes me to this mental hospital and as I'm getting checked in in like a room, I like confess to him that I had been smoking because I didn't say this, but I was in a cannabis induced psychosis. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I think it was a mix of uh my predispositions for things and like i was buying the weed just like from a friend and i was smoking a lot so i think it was just a perfect storm of things but yeah i told him i had been smoking weed and he was just like floored and once they checked me in and he had to leave that caused like a whole fiasco with my family because like no one knew and how um, long were you there in the hospital it was only 
two and a half days. Okay. But it was a like god awful experience. It was it's in this very rich part of like a little town outside of Columbus. Um, so it looks really pretty on the outside, but the people who work there are like horrible. I'm not shitting on all of them, but I don't think yeah. any experience in a mental institution is yeah. great. Yeah. I mean, unless you're just like, it's like happens to be the nicest people mm-hmm. and that genuinely just want to help you and make yeah. you feel as comfortable as possible. It's a very scary, uncomfortable, unsettling experience. For I feel sure. like you feel very, very isolated and confused and... Yeah you know yeah i think because what they tend to do is apply the like medical model to mental illness Mm -hmm. and it just doesn't translate very well it's scary yeah it's i know there's good institutions Mm -hmm. but you just hear such horrible like horror stories and that was like basically what happened with me so when i got admitted they tried to instantly diagnose me with borderline personality disorder which i don't have Mm -hmm. And that's not even how you diagnose a personality disorder. You have to be under surveillance from a psychiatrist for like months and months and months for them to give you that diagnosis. So it was just so inappropriate and just not correct. And there was a nurse there who actually got reported by another nurse while I was staying there who was telling everyone that I was completely faking what was going on and like, kid you not, she was, like, specifically telling people to be mean to me. Like, other nurses telling them to be unkind to me. I'm faking it. Like, I just want attention. Like, all this stuff. And which is just wild. I'm like, someone give me a fucking, like, Oscar then if I was making that up. Like, it was crazy. So this facility was just, like, really horrible. Mm-hmm. Um I wasn't eating or drinking anything, and they also weren't making sure that I was taking my medications, like including my transplant medications. Really shady stuff. And I was just an emotional wreck while while I was there. It was in this huge like hall, and all I did the whole time was walk laps around the whole place all day, every day. Like I never stopped walking, and I was like panicking. Mm-hmm. I was convinced that I was like right about all of it. And that my parents were in like witness protection. Like it was just a disaster. And at one point I like was convinced that I was like in hell. Like I thought I was in hell. And I was assigned this social worker and it was this guy and he always wore a mask. I was convinced that he was my ex, the like abusive one. But he's kind of like the hero of the story because they were not letting me leave. I was like trying to leave but when you go to a hospital and they tell and you say you want to kill yourself usually it's like mandatory you have to be there for 72 hours Mm -hmm. um and i would meet with my psychiatrist each day and be like i want to leave i like i need to leave and they're like you can you just have to sign against medical like recommendation and i was like well can i like talk to my parents first like because i was just i didn't know what to do I remember this psychiatrist, she was such a bitch. She was like, well, if you're an adult, then just figure it out and like left the room. And I was just like, I was like cussing out people there. It was so unlike me. Like I was just so mad. Like I could just tell that they were so just like awful towards me. It was just a bad situation. But what ended up happening was I requested that they do blood work so I could find out what my creatinine level was had the blood work, no one was telling me what the results were. I was asking people, I was like, what did it say? No one was telling me, it was so weird. The social worker, the guy, he was not allowed to do this. He was not allowed to be the one to tell me, but he walked up to me without saying anything and he had it written on a piece of paper and he was like showing it to me. And I don't remember what it was, but it was high. It was like elevated. And I look at him, I'm like, I, that's high. Like I need to go to an actual hospital. And he pretty much arranged for me to get transferred to a different hospital. It was like really because of him that I even like got out. Uh, But I got transferred to the children's hospital where I was convinced all of these families like were after me. So when I got admitted there, I was like convinced that they were all working there. And it was just like a really, really scary experience. 
um, and they immediately put me on medications. And after I got released, I was being seen at this place called the Epicenter in Columbus. It's a early psychosis intervention program. And once I went home, it took like a few weeks for me to come down from all of it. But they ended up diagnosing me with bipolar 2 affective disorder. So bipolar with psychotic elements. So I'm on the antipsychotic mood stabilizer and anxiety medication, which is just pretty standard for someone. And I'm assuming with bipolar. you can't really smoke weed. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's there's because that can trigger that. They, that yeah. can trigger it, right? Yeah. Okay. It's just it doesn't mesh well with someone right. who has the predispositions and everything. Yeah. After putting me on medications, it really helped bring me back to reality and it took a few weeks to come back down from all of it um and then ever since then i monthly see a psychiatrist through the epicenter just mm -hmm. to deal with med management and all of that like a, like two months later i got into another relationship with a narcissist so my mom says she says i really know how to pick them that's what i was thinking no, in my <laughs> the line so yes. typical yeah it's okay you got to go through some bad ones to realize for sure for sure um but yeah we started dating and it was very toxic like immediately and it got to the point where we were like really close to breaking up and now we're in january of 22 and i started getting this weird discomfort in my stomach like, it wasn't pain but it was like just this weird feeling mm -hmm. so i go to the emergency room just because i'm I'm like traumatized from my health stuff. So I was like, what is this? Yeah. They tell me that it's uh, ulcers and they didn't do any tests though. They just went off of my symptoms and they just sent me home basically. But I felt like something was wrong. I went back another time. I don't remember what they said. It was the second time, but just brushed it off, told me to go home. I go back a third time and they finally do actual tests and scans um, and they find a mass on my ovary and they're telling me that they suspect that I have cancer again which I was terrified when I heard ovary because ovarian cancer is like a death sentence mm -hmm. uh, and so they transferred me to a different hospital this time it's called the James it's like a really really good uh, cancer hospital in Columbus he transferred me there and I'm like with my now ex, but he stayed with me while I was there. And they told me that I have cancer again, but it's not ovarian. It's the exact same cancer I had before. Really? And what's weird about it is it wasn't a relapse. It was just like, cause they did some tests with the cells and it wasn't related to the first time at all. It was just so like, you just a got complete, it again. Yeah. Basically. It was just a okay. completely new thing. And they tell me I have non Hodgkin's Burgett's lymphoma again. And this time they're doing a six round treatment. And with that, what it looked like this time was I had chemo at home. I got a port again in my chest. I would go to the hospital on a Monday, they would start my chemo. And it'd be in like this little backpack that I would carry with me. I'd go home, come back on Wednesday to get a new bag, go home, come back on the Friday to finish it out. And then they would disconnect me. And I had, I think it was two weeks off, if I'm remembering correctly. And was it longer than three months this time? Yeah, it was from January to end of May, okay. I think. Yeah, so I had six rounds of that. And that time around was like the worst that my health had ever done to my yeah. mental state. And like I said before, I think it's because like I was an adult now and everything happened as you? a kid. I was, I got out of the hospital the day before my 22nd birthday okay. after I'd been diagnosed. Right. So it wasn't as like resilient. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And my relationship was just really toxic. Like yeah. when this all happened, I tried to break up with him because I just, didn't want to put him through. We hadn't been a lot like together that long. Mm -hmm. 
but he insisted that we stay together. But then he proceeded to consistently guilt trip me for having stayed with me through all of it. Mm -hmm. So it was just a disaster. And it's a whole different game when you're an adult with cancer because all the things that they would put you to sleep for as a kid, like you have to be fully awake for. Right. So like all the spinal taps I was awake for, like biopsies. And this is so gross. Like the way they did it was I had to like lay on my stomach and it's in my abdomen. It was like this huge mass in my abdomen. And they would stick a needle through my back mm. into like this mass in my stomach. And I was like, why did they do it that way? Yeah. But it was so weird to think about. And I, I forgot to mention this, but I've had sleeping problems uh, for a while. It started when I was 18, but my whole life I've had just really bad anxiety at nighttime. Which I think is just relatable to everyone. Yeah. How it's just like something about it just changes like how you think about things. Like it's just a scary time for me. So while I'm still getting treated for chemo, or while I'm still getting treated for cancer, I decide to get a med card because I wanted to start smoking again. And I was going to use it to help me sleep. Which was true, but with my just addictive tendencies, I started to abuse it like very, very heavily. Like I was going through, I was going through a half ounce like every like four days, which is just, that is ungodly. It's like so much weed. So yeah, I started smoking towards the end of my treatments and then I finished treatment end of May and... Uh, my boyfriend and I, it it only got worse after I finished treatment. We thought things would get better like once it was over, like between us, but it just got really, really bad. At the tail end of our relationship, there was like this week where I missed my meds, like my psych meds somehow. And so my mental health just got weird. Like I was very erratic and emotional. I because I think I had missed the antipsychotic. So that was just not good. And I ended up breaking up with him because we got in this fight one day where he told me that no one loves me and no one else is ever going to love me because I'm too mentally ill and that my family doesn't love me because I'm so mentally ill. And so I broke up with him. I was like, okay, like that's insane to say to someone. Um, and we were still seeing each other for like two months, even after we broke up. But I was like realizing all this sort of like narcissistic, like abuse that had gone on. And uh, yet again, was really on a decline mentally. Like I wasn't eating anymore. I was like isolated from everyone because all I ever wanted to do was smoke. I was just on a really, really dark path. And it got to the point where I was starting to have like some psychotic like symptoms again. But since I was so heavily medicated, it didn't get to that level at all. But it just, it was just really, really bad. Like thinking about all the stuff he did to me was driving me insane. And there was one day where I had therapy that day and I had smoked before. And I felt just like really weird. Like it was just this weird, like everything looked like surreal and it just felt like familiar from the episode that had happened. And I told myself, I was like, okay, I have to go to the dispensary again today because I was out of weed. And I told myself I'm either stopping cold turkey today or I'm going to be giving my weed to my parents to hold on to. So I only use it to help me sleep. And I kind of knew which option I should do. So I quit cold turkey that day. I went to my therapist saying, like, I, I need more help. Like, I'm really doing badly. So she recommended a PHP IOP program, which is partial hospitalization and intensive outpatient. Um, she recommended it to me. And I did that program for the whole month of January of 23. And it was very grueling. It's like a lot. It's for the first week you're there from like eight to four. And it's just like therapy and like group therapy like all day. And 
we'd have lessons on certain things, learning certain skills. And then the three weeks after that were like eight to noon. And during that time, did you feel like you brought up a lot of the things that you had been through with all the diagnosis and? Um, the way it worked was like it was a group therapy model. Okay. So we didn't meet one-on-one with anyone. So I only ever really got to speak about myself in the group like three times. But I kind of... Looking back on it, I like that it was that way just because I just, this sounds terrible, but people usually like chime in. Other people in the group will chime in to when you're talking and everything people would say was just very like, it wasn't anything, any advice I hadn't heard before. It was just like, I know, like I just need to get this out. So I just didn't really like talking about myself during that time, but I really enjoyed giving advice to other people. And I met like the most amazing people in that program. And it was truly just very pivotal. Like it kind of changed Mm -hmm. like the trajectory of my life almost. Uh, It was a really, really hard process because I was sober now trying to deal with just pain. But yeah, I, when I was discharged, uh, People in the room, like, will go around and just, like, say goodbye to you and, like, say something about you um, the day you, like, are supposed to leave. And just everyone said, like, the most sweet things. It was just so emotional. We were all just, like, crying. Mm -hmm. It was just so, like, healing. And, yeah, after that, I, like, started a new job. And, yeah, the whole year of, like, 2023 was just so transformative for me. It was really really great how it all like worked out I think it takes a while to to get back on track after so many things like that happen and you had physical and mental things so it's like it's not just one thing happens and you get over the hump and you keep it pushing it's like every time you got over the hump another thing came up so I feel like it takes a while to kind of digest all of that and heal from it Mm -hmm. and then be able to kind of like figure out okay these are the things that I kind of need to balance out and, yeah. you know, become stable with. And then I can kind of get mm-hmm. on a normal track with yeah. things. It's hard to, you can't just like go about living yeah. your everyday life right. when there's so many other serious things that have happened. Exactly. For sure. And yeah, that was just like such a good year after 22. That was, 22 was just so bad. Like it was so horrible. Um but I was like dangerously thin when like I was in the program and I just like was so scared of being forced into like eating disorder treatment. So I like was forcing myself to eat and I don't know. I'm just like, I'm really proud of myself for that whole thing because I like really pulled myself out of like a horrible situation. Yeah. And you have to want it bad enough for yourself yeah. to do that. For sure. And I'm just very proud that I had like the drive Mm -hmm. to just push through all of it. And I ended up dropping out of nursing school because I didn't want to do it. And I applied to University of Cincinnati. That's where I go now. And I'm studying forensic psychology. And I'm very excited about it. It's a I think it fits me more, yeah. especially after my program and like being able to relate to people and like give advice that they found to be helpful. Mm-hmm. I really just am excited to go into that. Just, yeah, I think it's more fitting. But yeah, that's just pretty much where I'm at now. I'm very happy, very stable. I just passed, passed like a year sober from weed in like this past Good December. Job. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. No, and I I think that, like I said, a lot, when all these things happen, I think it is really important in our own time to talk to somebody, whether it's just like, because I know how you mentioned that you've heard the same advice before and it's like, I know. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's not even about getting advice, but just getting it out. Yeah. Because something that I've realized is, you know, we can talk to our friends and, but I don't think anybody really is meant to know how to listen like a therapist does Mm -hmm. and that might sound cheesy but 
because I, I didn't really have much luck with therapists for a while, but now I finally yeah. found a good one. Yeah. And just talking to her feels like the biggest weight off my shoulders. Yeah. Um, and I don't think we're ever – I always say this on this show, but I don't think we're ever completely 100% healed from things. Mm -hmm. But I think that we can learn to work through them and kind of accept them more and be like, yes, this happened. I went through this and this is how I'm dealing with it to move forward in a healthier way mentally. Because I think if we just bottle things up, it takes a toll and then they come back out Mm -hmm. as we know, like years or months down the road and we're like wait I didn't deal with that and I'm still struggling with it right so I think it's really important that whatever works for you know different people and different methods it's important to do yeah yeah even just preparing for being on your show and I would practice like just telling everything and it would just like make me cry to Mm -hmm. talk about it especially all the health problems like it's not something I've ever processed And it was just, it sounds so stupid, but I was just like shocked. I was like, why does this bother me? Like well, it never has. Well, also I think too because yeah. you're, you're past it now, but it's almost like you're you're probably sad thinking about how young you were. And yeah. it's almost like if you were to hear someone else going through this that you cared about, mm-hmm. it's heartbreaking. Yeah. So to read it back and hear it out loud and know well, like, damn, this happened to me. Like it's, it's sad. Yeah. And you're allowed to cry about it yeah. as many times as you want. And I think that it's really healthy that you do because I think that what most people do is when they're faced with something mm-hmm. traumatic is their, their response a lot of times is like, okay, ignore it. And just right. get through it because right. that's what's easier almost. Yeah. It's not easy to break down and let it all in. Yeah. So I think it's important that you really understand it and feel those emotions mm-hmm. now because you didn't really get a chance to feel them before. Yeah. And I had always been convinced that it was like situational mm-hmm. issues. So I always knew that it would come to an end at some point. But that came back and like bit me in the ass because then it – wasn't like that anymore it was to the point where I couldn't handle any sort of like negative like era of my life I'm still trying to find like a good therapist because I've never really had like a good one it's hard yeah because don't give up keep trying I know it's just it's annoying it's so annoying it's like it's repetitive yeah but I definitely need to find one just I think it's important to Seek that out even like if you're doing okay because I've been doing well for a while now. But like I said, like this was bringing up so much and I was like, shit, like I really need to like – I want to find a like a medical trauma Mm -hmm. like specialist, like I think something that people don't realize is you can be doing really well in life financially, physically. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that you're totally fine mentally. Right. You know, like there's things that come up in therapy for me that I didn't even know so bother me. And they just like naturally come up, which is so important because it's things from years ago that I haven't Mm -hmm. even thought of. Mm -hmm. So I think that like you said, whether you're okay or not okay, everybody should be talking to somebody because there's always something that probably has happened in our lives that we haven't really sorted through. For sure, for sure. Especially if you're raised in any sort of like dysfunction and you don't know it's dysfunction. Right. You think it's normal. I can't believe I fit that all in the amount of time. I think you did great. Thank you. You did really, really well. And I always, you know, the thing is too is there's, I think it's good because you touched on like mental stuff, physical stuff, and whether Mm -hmm. somebody has dealt with physical or mental or both, it's like they can really relate to everything that you said. Yeah. And even the religious aspect. Right. There's a lot of people that have had very negative um, experiences yeah. with religion and it's unfortunate because not everybody or not all religions are bad but right, for right. some reason there's a lot of groups that just take yeah. the darkest parts of it yeah and i don't i don't know why it's kind I of know. but it's just like the modern day religion it's bizarre yeah and i think it's too right now it's so easy in today's society to kind of like convince people to yeah. join any type of right. anything right so people just take advantage of what is already around. Yeah. Um, But no, I think you did such a good job explaining everything. Thank you. Um, There's definitely a lot of different parts of your story. Yeah. And you've been through a shit ton. So (laughs) if you ever have days that you just feel like, fuck, Mm -hmm. like, you know what I mean? Like, it's fine because you've been through a lot. Thank you. And you deserve to have days, kids, 
<laughs> don't start. Don't start. You deserve to have days that you just, if you want to be in bed all day and cry and be miserable, everybody can have those days. Mm-hmm. Um, but then you should also have the days where you're like, okay, like I need to get the fuck up and I need yeah. to work with myself. Yeah. Because you're none of us are ever going to reach our goals and reach where we need to be unless we work for it. Right. And I feel like you've already had so many moments where, I mean, you clearly have it in you. Like you've worked Thank through you. and gotten through so much <laughs> hard and very serious shit Mm -hmm. so you have it it's just but it's normal if some days you don't feel like pushing through anymore but just make sure sure. you balance those out with the days that you work you know with like coming on here I just wanted to like just put more emphasis on just the program I did and like just I want to like encourage people to take care of themselves and if they have the means to like do a program or get more help like it really changed everything for me and I, think I still it's an think resource yeah for sure. and I still think it's still okay for people who are on their journeys and aren't ready to come to that place that's okay too but I think people just push themselves to the side and don't think they deserve to like take a chunk of time for themselves yeah. but it can make such a big impact um and something I've learned is like it's so helpful for me to have like support. Like that sounds so obvious, but I think with mental illness, people want to hide it and they want to keep it to themselves. But like you start talking to people and like let people be there for you. It's so healing and it helps so much. But that was like just what I really wanted to say is like people out there just deserve to be cared for and to feel okay. Um, And that, getting through things sucks but it's definitely possible yeah you can do it yeah but no you did you did so good and thank you you so much for wanting to come on yeah of course and share your story seriously i can't thank you enough you did amazing you should be proud of yourself thank you for having me of course this is like a dream oh oh my god you're so cute (laughs)